on my way to Easter Island. Finally, I have time to summarize my notes. I'm recalling the intellectual thrashing I took when I presented my Atlantis connection theories at the Paris Symposium. The university board was so embarrassed that they put me on extended paid leave. I felt belittled and betrayed. Nevertheless, the funded free time allowed me to continue my research to a far greater success than I had expected. What an irony. My fiancé, Laura, who remained supportive during my years of professional ridicule, helped me obtain the first irrefutable evidence that I may be right. She had been working on the Human Genome Project, literally unraveling mysteries of man's genetic code. It was her simple suggestion that was the key. In order to prove a solid link among several ancient civilizations, I had been cataloging and cross-referencing their cultural commonalities. Laura, being a geneticist, suggested looking for a genetic link as well, and agreed to help me by analyzing DNA samples from ancient skeletal remains of Anasazi, Maya, Egyptian, and Easter Island cultures. Incredibly, in just a few short months, we found a genetic link. But we discovered even more astounding evidence. At different yet distinct times in history, the people of these ancient civilizations seem to have experienced a genetic modification. I still remember the rush of adrenaline I felt when Laura called me to tell me that she had found clear evidence of recombinant DNA formation in the bone samples. The genetic fingerprint was there plain as day. Carbon dating of older samples from each culture showed no evidence of this genetic addition, but samples from later stages showed varying degrees of the change. I have no doubt that some common genetic material had been introduced at a distinct and critical phase in the development of these ancient peoples. We ruled out accidental mutations, since most mutations are random and generally harmful. We calculated that the genetic changes that we discovered closely coincided with the flourishing of these great civilizations. Whatever change had taken place had been widespread, specific, and most important of all, beneficial. Apparently, these new genes had already withstood the test of time in some unknown donor group. I believe the question of commonality has now been answered. There is a definite, demonstrable link among the cultures. Other commonalities could have been argued away as coincidental, but not this particular one. Now, the last step is to pinpoint the donors. I have my own theory, and all of my research points me in the direction of Easter Island. There it is on the horizon. I have finally arrived. It's been a long flight from Chile. I've set up camp on the southeast corner of the island. I am here, now, on this tiny speck of land in the Pacific at the foot of an enormous carved Moai statue. I have been preparing for this moment my whole career, thinking that once I was here and able to touch the very face of this mystery, I would receive a flash of insight. This crude statue stares out beyond the horizon, unconcerned and content to keep its silence for another thousand years. Perhaps I'm just not listening but it feels as if the air itself blows more quietly near this magnificent monolith. Questions filled my mind as I stared into the face of the statue. What is it trying to tell me, and what secrets does it conceal? Is this legend true that after it was quarried and carved, the statue simply got up and walked here? That explanation is so outlandish that I suspect it contains a measure of truth, perhaps a very large measure. It's almost sunset. I'm sitting next to the Moai, feeling somewhat protected by it. But as the day darkens, I can't help but feel that it might uproot itself and walk away and mingle in the moonlight with its 600 brothers. For years, I've marveled in awe at the engineering feats achieved by ancient cultures. They excelled in their handling of immense stones, some as large as a house. Even cultures whose other accomplishments may be unimpressive or perhaps lost seem to have used a knowledge or a technology now lost to us. Many have struggled with this mystery. My focus has been on the mystery of rapid advancements in widespread civilizations and over the even greater enigma of how they vanished. Then, as if the answer came looking for me, my own research 
made the link not only possible but obvious. An external source for their enlightenment and acceleration of knowledge could be explained by the lost city of Atlantis. Meticulously, I collected similar-looking artifacts and inscriptions from cultures separated by impossible ocean distances. I cataloged common features of buildings constructed by these cultures. I followed promising geological and historical leads that point to a vanished continent and even visited fascinating underwater structures made from enormous stone blocks. The detached expression on this 30-ton moai seems to have been carefully crafted to drive me crazy with questions. I've analyzed mythology from many cultures, telling of gods and supernatural mythical beings, and their incredible feats of power, flight, and magic. The ability to heal and create and destroy. These beings lived on mountains, in the sky, and deep underground. It was my own father's experience that made it crystal clear to me that any primitive culture might create incredible stories about the mission and feats of technologically advanced visitors. In World War II, my father's air transport unit landed in New Guinea. There, the native tribesmen considered them gods and magicians brought by celestial ships. The surprised natives were terrified by the incredible animals that came from the sky. Army mules. I can imagine how in even a few generations, the account of this encounter would expand into fantastic tales so that the original event would be virtually lost in myth. Having sifted common truths from all of my research, I've been screaming Atlantis from the top of my lungs, but it seems that to those who choose to believe, there is no evidence on Earth that can make a difference. If I found an Atlantean and interviewed him or her on the evening news and had them lift the Statue of Liberty with a beam from their belt buckle, the purest and established experts would find a way to dismiss it as pure illusion. Oh, come off of it, Alex. If an alien did that, they wouldn't disbelieve you. They would just sue or shoot the alien. If I'm right... The evidence of common genetic advancement that Lara found among these ancient cultures will tie them together in indisputable ways. And if I can find remnants of Atlantis itself, my work will be done. Well, actually, it will begin anew. Before I drift off, I must log the exact reason I'm here on this remote island. For millennia, worldwide legends have told of an island continent called Atlantis, a land said to be populated by an advanced race of great warriors, scientists, artisans, and physicians. If the influence of the Atlanteans had been passed to the Egyptians, the Mayan, and the Anasazi, and the Easter Islanders, that would explain the rapid rise of these four civilizations as well as some others. When I announced my conviction that Atlantis had been the source of the flowering of ancient cultures, the ridicule from academia doubled overnight. I became an outcast in the world of archaeology, as isolated as this island. I think it was part fate and part blind luck that a carved wooden Rongo Rongo board from Easter Island with hieroglyphs intact came into my possession. I might have overlooked its importance if I had not noticed that its markings were shockingly similar to inscriptions I had seen on artifacts from other civilizations half a world away and centuries apart. The previous year, I had been on a dig in the Yucatan when I discovered a mysterious artifact engraved with four different versions of hieroglyphics. I had already determined that the first three sets of inscriptions were petroglyph symbols from the ancient Egyptian, Mayan, and Anasazi civilizations. The fourth version of pictorial writing was clearly identical to the symbols on the Rongo Rongo board. Have I found another Rosetta Stone, a key to translating ancient writing? I came here hoping to decipher the markings and find a connection. I knew I needed the help of a native islander to understand this forgotten language. It's a cloudy morning. Last night, I literally fell asleep on my journal. I want to finish describing this connection before breakfast. It's so rewarding when endless bickering by experts is settled by a little common sense. For decades, debates raged on whether the markings on Rongo Rongo boards were merely decorative or a written language. I can thank my lucky stars that in the 60s, Thomas Barthel, with sound logic and some scholarly luck, proved the boards were actually books. His fortuitous find was in learning that a century before in Tahiti, an Easter Islander had been found who could chant songs from the boards. 
the chants were translated to Polynesian symbols, but the translation turned out to be imperfect because some parts made no sense. However, it was enough to prove that this was a true language, and it allowed Barthel to fine-tune the translations and publish them. The few available boards contain prayers and island mythology. The Egyptians, the Maya, and the Easter Islanders had all developed written languages while neighboring peoples had remained illiterate. I suspect time will confirm that the petroglyphs of the Anasazi are actually a legitimate language as well. I'm off to speak with a native guide. It's been almost a week since my last entry, but my time has not been spent in purely archaeological pursuits. Shortly after I had arrived, several natives told me of an old hermit shaman, a priest, who lived in a cave by the sea. They considered him insane, uh, but empowered with magic and evil powers. It was not the first time I've heard a harmless eccentric described this way. Yeah, I know the feeling. I'd already come so far for answers. I took my chances and went to seek him out on the far side of the island. Instead of a witch doctor, I found a lonely, withering old man, hardly able to care for himself. In his cave, however, the charms, tools, and decorations spoke of a once powerful and learned sorcerer. I, I couldn't judge his age, but he was easily the oldest man I'd ever seen. I've spent several days caring for him, treating him with the utmost respect. This, I believe, has won me his trust. Yesterday, the old man became more lucid and began telling me his account of the history of Easter Island. He described how long ago a great Polynesian chief named Hotumatua had a vision of a new homeland somewhere in the direction of the rising sun. The chief sent seven young men east in an outrigger to search the seas and they discovered Easter Island. Hotumatua and his followers set out for the island in two large voyaging canoes. They brought along several species of animals, plants, and trees. Lush vegetation and vast forests covered the island when his people first arrived. There was enough fresh water for a population of thousands. The descendants of these settlers became known as the people of Rapa Nui, and they flourished on Easter Island. Over centuries of isolation, they developed unique customs like the Virgin Caves and a strange religious ritual called the Cult of the Birdman. They were a rather primitive people, without the knowledge or the skills required to carve, transport, and erect the giant stone statues that dot the island. I would like to quickly interject here. How those statues are made itself is a really interesting question, and uh, up until around 2012, the main prevailing theory, and I guess to an extent, one of the main prevailing theories is that they were carved and rolled along logs that were created from the destruction of the forest that was used to make all the logs. Um, recent, uh, re I think back in uh, 2012, a theory was proposed um, that said that they actually could have walked the statues because of their center of gravity being forward, and it wouldn't have taken as many people, and the islanders would not have died due to ecocide, killing their own ecology, but because of, of disease, and then destruction of the forest can be attributed to uh, rats that... Um, came and stowed away on European vessels for, from European explorers uh, due to rat teeth marks found in some of the uh, seeds for the trees. And the trees themselves uh, were palm trees and their their, um, their bark, their, uh, their, it's not really wood that you can use to make a canoe. So once you're on the island, you're kind of stuck there. Um, this um, theory paints the Rapa Nui in a, in a more, uh, a less aggressive light. Um, I personally like it, but... Um, I'm not an expert on the um, on archaeology, so I just wanted to bring that up because that is a competing theory that does make sense to me, and I think it would be kind of sad if we always just thought that these people killed themselves by building a bunch of statues, which is possibly not what they did. Uh, in one of Douglas Adams' books, uh, Last Chance to See, there was a couple entries that talked of... Um, being very, very careful with uh, letting other ships dock at uh, islands marked for preservation because of that same problem. Rats introduced to an unstable ecology can totally kill the ecology and therefore any of the endangered species that depend on that ecology. Without any rats' natural predators, 
they can multiply to fucking huge numbers. I must write this now, while it's still fresh in my mind. I had asked the old shaman if he knew how the custom of carving the immense stone statues began. He seemed surprised that I did not know and proceeded to tell me. In my lifetime, people had asked me how the Moai were built and how they were carried and put into place. You are all fascinated by tales of conquer, slavery, and destruction, but no one seems to care about the story of the Great Ones. The first Moai came from them. One morning, during the Council of the High Sun, they walked down from the hillside. They wore strange clothing all over their bodies, and in their faces there was such peace that no one questioned or feared them. They offered brilliant gifts that no one here had ever seen. They sat and spoke with the chief and his high priest until late into the night. The next day, when the people awoke, the Great Ones were gone, and overlooking the village stood the first Moai. So the first Moai simply appeared there. It was a gift, a sign of power from the Great Ones. Years later, the people learned to work the stone of the island and carved great statues from the slopes of Ranu Raku, inspired by the first great gift. The old man is asleep now. I will not disturb him. Once more, I'm faced with the archeologist's dilemma. What was the gift and where is the vein of truth in this? Do I simply take it at face value? It's almost sunset. During our evening meal, I asked the shaman if he remembered any more about the legend of the Great Ones. I've heard it said that during the night of the Great Ones, the edge of the quarry glowed with red and blue lights, and vapors rose into the sky like the breath of a mountain. I don't know if those were dreams or not. The shaman has begun to recall more and more of the history that must have been passed down among generations of storytellers. I wish I had brought a tape recorder. I can hardly keep up with my notes. Generations passed before the Great Ones returned. The islanders at the time had begun to carve moai in larger and greater numbers, each statue more immense than the last. Their ambition drove them to carve moai larger than they could transport, and many moai remained lying in the quarry. The Great Ones praised our people for their works, and before the eyes of all, they moved our moai one by one with their chanting lights. In a single day, all the moai of the time were put in place along the coast. What were the chanting lights? No one knows, but they made the air under the statues blue and swirling like the sea and they made the ground rumble. I had to ask him where did the Great Ones come from. On ships, did they fly like birds? They did not come from the sea. They had no boats. The chief sent runners to search the entire coast for boats or camps. Many thought they would finally see the white ship of legends, but they found nothing. I knew from my research that Ranu Raku was a volcano on the eastern part of the island, and the site of a huge quarry containing almost 300 statues in various stages of completion. Measurements show that the Moai weighed an average of 15 tons, and many of the statues were far heavier. Some partially carved Moai had been estimated to weigh over 300 tons. The Rapa Nui people had neither the wheel nor modern machinery. If the old priest's story is accurate, the huge statues were not dragged or rolled across the ground, but floated above it in a very short time. My imagination is swimming. After the Great Ones left again, the island people became obsessed with building Moai. The priests thought it was a way to summon the Great Ones to perform more of their magic. There seemed to be no limit to the size of the Moai they craved to carve. The chiefs and priests encouraged this work, and one day they drove the people to move the Great Moai on their own. The priests proclaimed that they themselves possessed the powers of the Great Ones, and if the people wanted to earn their blessings, they would need to prove their worthiness. It was a turning point for the people of Rapa Nui. In their attempts to move the Moai, they used all kinds of riggings and resources from the island. Once they were obsessed with carving Moai, now they were obsessed with moving them. Whole sections of forest were cut to build sleds and frames and pathways for these seemingly immovable stone giants. 
There were many deaths and few successes, but each success inspired more attempts and even more ravaging of the very life of our island. The old man's story is no fantasy. Although some of this surprising knowledge, the cultural events the old man described closely match other accounts about the decline of the Easter Islanders. I'll just interject here to remind about that competing theory, but um, the idea that they destroyed themselves with ecocide is, is a bit debatable. The Great Ones returned, but this time, when they saw what had occurred, they smiled no more. They did not punish anyone, but they refused to move any more Moai. They also took back their most precious gift. What was the gift? No one knows now what the gift was. They left the people with a warning to safeguard the givers of life of Rapa Nui. The trees, the fruiting plants, the good land. Then they walked away and never returned. At that same time, the teachers and their learners disappeared. Who were the teachers and learners? The priests? These were a small group of islanders who isolated themselves from the rest. They took little part in the senseless building of Moai, then tried to steer the people towards more productive works and, and toward making good use of the land that was our mother. But they had little power or voice compared to the fierce nature and bloody ways of the chiefs and the priests. When the teachers and learners disappeared, some thought they had been secretly executed to keep them from speaking against the rulers. No one really knows what had happened to them. As resources dwindled, our people of Rapa Nui were driven to desperate acts and began to kill each other for the meat of their bodies. While the shaman was sleeping, I spent the afternoon studying the masonry work at Ahu Tahira on the southwest coast. The huge basalt blocks used in the construction of statue bases are so precisely fitted together that a knife blade could not be fitted between them. I had a vague sense of deja vu. This wall reminds me of brilliant Incan stonework. Incan masons constructed their walls with irregularly shaped bricks that had no pattern, but managed to create incredibly stable structures, packed so tightly, in fact, that you couldn't insert a sharp knife between the stones. I have seen such precision stonework before more than once. The platform strongly resembled the building styles of the Egyptians and the Maya. Such precision seems oddly out of place among primitive cultures. Yeah, I don't think you're giving them as much credit as they really deserve. Another coincidence, or another link between the four civilizations, opinions vary. My money is on a definite connection. I return to the shaman's cave to find him awake but still in his bed. His face echoed waves of emotions as he described how the ancestors of today's islanders survived cannibalism by hiding in remote caves. When I finally showed him the Rongo Rongo board I brought and asked him about its special markings, his eyes opened wide. He became agitated and began to repeat the name Make Make and spoke of a glowing cave and the chanting light protected by the forbidden darkness. Then, for a while, he refused to talk. But as I pressed on as gently as I could, he confessed that he had sworn an oath to his predecessor to reveal the cave's location only to a single soul and only near the time of his death. He admitted he was a descendant of the teachers. He spoke of a passageway ruled by black magic, a gateway to the underworld, and said that those who entered it would vanish forever. Some claim that the Great Ones had come out of that cave long ago he said with a fading voice. This last statement set me reeling. These visitors had no boats, no flying craft. They didn't materialize from a puff of smoke. They came out of a cave, and the cave is here. I knew the island was strewn with secret family caves where people hid in times of warfare or slave raids. The caves were handed down from generation to generation and filled with carved cave stones and kava kava figures. The Kava Kava figures commemorated the state of desperate starvation and are considered good luck. I had purchased several from the local carvers, but had yet to acquire any truly ancient ones. Cave stones were carved in a variety of shapes, including boats, heads, whales, and feet. The owners hid these items from other natives as well. These caves were invisible from the surface and required ingenious mechanisms to open. For this, they utilize a cave stone as a key to access the secret opening. 
a mixture of ground human bones was often placed in a hole to kill intruders with black magic. The face of Make Make was also a common theme. Perhaps one of those family caves holds a secret. As much as I'd like to know more, I will not disturb him in his rest. He's gone. In many ways, he was the most significant teacher I've ever had. A man too weak to even walk has led me to the door of what may be the greatest discovery of my life. He had died clutching the bracelet I had given him. Out of respect, I buried him with it uh, and swept his cave as if expecting him to return. Then uh, I began to follow his cryptic directions to the mysterious cave. I didn't sleep a wink last night. Instead, I had tossed and turned the shaman's words echoing in my ears. If the shaman's story were even half true, the Rapa Nui advancement was a result of an external impetus. After the Norwegian explorer Thor Heyerdahl saw the Moai, he expressed the same conviction as was quoted in the National Geographic magazine's uh, March 1993 article titled Easter Island Unveiled. It had stated, One thing is certain. This was not the work of a canoe load of Polynesian wood carvers who set to work on the bare rock faces while they landed merely because they could find no trees to whittle. The first Europeans who reached the island in the 1700s thought the same thing. They couldn't believe that the primitive natives they found could have carved, transported, and erected the huge moai, although I'm often surprised by human ingenuity too. Quick aside here, the rock they were carved from is tough rock. It's a volcanic rock. Um, it's a little softer. It doesn't require metal tools to carve out. I confess that my own theory, the Atlantean influence spurred the explosion of the Rapa Nui culture, sounds as far-fetched as any other explanations. Maybe a little more far-fetched. What's kept me going all this time is the fact that my esteemed colleagues chose to ignore that over a century ago, the great German archaeologist Henrik Schliemann believed enough in the epic Greek poem, the Iliad, and the Odyssey to make the greatest discovery of his time. Schliemann was convinced that Homer's account of the Trojan War was in fact not fiction, and followed the poet's clues to the gates of the last city of Troy. A coincidence, they had said. And now, Professor Nichols is going to equal Schliemann's feat. But instead of discovering a lost city, I aim to find the wellspring of civilization. I'm closer than ever I can feel it. Yeah, your esteemed colleagues might have had a point. Schliemann's methods left a lot to be desired, when what they should have left is enough of the archaeological site remaining. His methods were criticized as he focused so much on finding evidence he was right, or at least the theory he was co-opting from someone else was right, that he caused damage to the surrounding settlements. I'm not an archaeologist, but I do understand at least how important it is to be careful in preserving a site. The landmarks that the old man described are hard to find. He spoke from memories that today don't exactly match the present-day landscape. This flat area has the telltale round depressions left by post holes. Uh, a village once stood here, uh, perhaps one of the settlements wiped out during the ferocious fighting between the clans, or perhaps they were abducted by the Peruvian slave hunters in the 1800s. Sunset, I'm going back to camp. It's almost midnight. I'm making this journal entry by the light of a full moon. I have been tossing and turning for hours, unable to sleep, overwhelmed by the intermingled feelings of impending discovery and the excitement of the unknown. The natives call it Easter Island. All right, let's see if I can pronounce this. Tepito Otehanua. Close enough. The Navel of the World. A fitting name for a land lost in the vastness of the Pacific. The nearest population centers are in Chile, 2,300 miles to the east, and Tahiti, 2,600 miles to the west. If I may quickly interject, that that is a popular translation, but I think there's more than one um, translation for Tepito. And if you use that other translation, that doesn't translate to the navel of the world. It translates more to the end of the land, or more better referred to as, as land's end, which is uh, fitting itself as well. Out there are three towering volcanic cones. 
There must be a magma source close beneath the island, and where there is magma, there is a possibility of geothermal energy in the form of superheated water and steam. Could this have been the power source used to move the giant moai? And where does one find a chanting light? It's a windy morning. Seabirds are flocking and feeding along the coastline. The virgin caves are below me on the side of the cliff. Uh, these are the caverns where maidens were forced to spend weeks in the dark solitude to purify them before marriage. Yeah, well, fuck their culture. <laughs> it seems the islanders had an ongoing preoccupation with the caves and with the underworld. Societies all over the world have rituals associated with virgins. Uh, yet only the Rapa Nui chose to purify their maidens in caves. Yeah, it's still a dick move to do to someone. Did this custom exist at some attempt to mimic the emergence of the Great Ones? Uh, did they simply feel that being in a cave for long periods was a way to become more like those revered visitors? I must find that cave this morning. The shaman was right. I can understand why the Great Ones withdrew. <laughs> Here on the slopes of the Poik volcano, I'm at the site of a terrible massacre. The Rapa Nui people were divided into two main groups, the dominant Hanu Ip and the oppressed Hanu Momoko. Professor Yun's translations for these terms is long ears and short ears, although I think these days the more accepted translations are um, stocky versus slender, but it matters very little in either way. Then it seems like he agrees with me. It matters very little. It was some senseless class distinction. One day, according to the Rongo Rongo records, the Hanu Ip ordered the Hanu Momoko to remove all the millions of stones scattered across the island's fields. This demand finally pushed the Hanumomoko to rise in bloody revolt. The Hanuip fled to the Poik volcano where they dug a long trench and filled it with material that would burn so as to shield themselves with a wall of fire. I could still see the traces of the trench as I set up camp for the night. But secretly, the Hanumomoko penetrated the camp and waited for the trench to be lit and threw their hated masters into the flaming trench. It seems unusual that a relatively small population would develop two separate classes and, and that one would come to dominate the other. History recalls that when superiority leads to enslavement, the downfall of the culture is sure to follow. It has not been easy to follow the old shaman's directions. Landmarks on the island have changed greatly over the centuries, and most of the Moai markers are now toppled into the grassy slopes by natural forests or the work of enemy tribes. Relying largely on intuition and luck, I had searched for hours, and this afternoon, I finally found the entrance to the glowing cave. However, I see nothing glowing. Maybe the name was meant to scare off attempts at finding it. How ironic, I I've combed the island to discover the cave near my campsite. The inner cave has some kind of entry mechanism. It's been baffling me for some time. It is either pure magic or based on some futuristic technology I'm not familiar with. I'm going to assume the technology part... To the uh, enlightened mind, nothing is inexplicable, it is merely not yet explained. Whichever the case, this device certainly did not originate from the primitive Rapa Nui. Recalling the shaman's words, I've finally been able to access the inner cave and begin my exploration. I was shaking so much I almost dropped my lantern. Then I saw the glow. Of all the wonders I've witnessed on this island, none compares to what I have experienced today. How can I describe it? In this truly incredible room, there is a view or a portal in it. I, I can see swirling images of what I believe to be ancient civilizations. Each world appears pristine. It's like looking into a crystal ball of the past. This may well be the greatest archaeological discovery of all time. I spent the rest of the afternoon watching the swirling nebula, trying to understand its purpose, its power source, and its operation. It has been waiting here for several thousand years. Could this be a time machine? The shaman's account is proving not only to be based on fact, but literal truth. This is not simply a viewer. If the Great Ones came out of the cave, they came and went by way of this. This is certainly the culmination of an incredibly advanced technology far more than anyone has ever attributed to the Atlanteans. Who the hell were they? Where did their incredible technology come from? Could they be humans from the future or aliens? Whatever it is, it definitely is not of this time. I'm compelled to reach out and touch the swirling panorama. It, it must be safe, or there would be some protective barrier, or possibly the aliens don't believe in OSHA compliance. I'm both thrilled and horrified at what might happen. 
This discovery is so incredible that I must think clearly about my options. Before I touch the nebula, I'm going to send off a telegram just in case. And that was the telegram I received that brought me here to Easter Island. Which means if he's not here and his journal's here, and the journal seems to contain more pages about other places, he went ahead and did it. He touched the swirling thing and now he's gone. And, and instead of coming all the way back, wait, hold on, something's wrong here. If he, if, if I'm reading his journal, and his journal records all the civilizations he went to during his trip through the past, why is the journal here and the camera here, but he isn't? Where the hell is he? We gotta get to the bottom of this. All right, here's the goal. Find the campsite, find the cave, find the stargate, and find him. I would also like an answer to the question of how my friend Alex was able to write his journal entries with perfectly good center justification of the text. How exactly do you do that without knowing how much you're gonna write for every line?